the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, completely innocent, having all of your sin heaped upon Him. You say, why? So that in Him, we might become righteousness. just a tad bit overdressed this morning. If you're a first timer here, let me explain myself. I I actually ran into a a fella in the bathroom. We were washing our hands, first time I'd ever seen him. And uh, I discovered he was a first timer. And he's like, I was told we were just supposed to dress casually today. I'm like, I'll I'll explain. I'll explain. Somebody, I got everything from Colonel Sanders to the Easter Bunny. Um, but you know, uh, when you get invited to a banquet or some kind of feast or event, <clears throat> and you call up a friend and you're like, hey, what are we supposed to wear? Because you don't want to show up overdressed. You don't want to show up underdressed. You, you just kind of want to blend in. Now, you're cool if people are like, wow, you look good. But you, you don't want to you know, stick out like a sore thumb. And so you want to make sure that you have the proper attire. And if you show up and you're overdressed you'll get the kind of reaction that I got today where people are like, whoa, whoa, you know. Or if you're underdressed, most people won't say anything except for the people who are close to you, like you need to go home right now and change kind of thing. But none of us love showing up with the wrong clothes at at a certain event. And today we're going to talk about this truth that if you want to be part of the kingdom of heaven, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to enjoy the, the banquet, then you got to have the right clothes on. That's what we're going to talk about today. So the last several weeks, we've looked at Jesus' last few days prior to his arrest and crucifixion. He comes into the city, and people are waving palm branches, singing out Hosanna, just like we did a few minutes ago. And they're thinking to themselves, man, we sure would love it if you would become the king of Israel, just like the Davidic king, just like David who took care of his enemies and he was big and strong and everybody loved him and he was powerful politically and he was also powerful spiritually. Maybe Jesus is like the new David. But Jesus didn't come to be a new David. He came to do something brand new altogether. And he didn't come to free them from Rome. He came to free them from a much bigger issue, which was sin. So after coming into the city of Jerusalem and people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, he gets into the temple courts and he overthrows the tables of the money changers and the religious leaders don't like this and they're upset at the the things that Jesus is doing and Jesus begins to teach them and we've looked at many of these teachings the last few weeks and today we're going to look at a parable that Jesus gives in the temple courts that day, probably on Wednesday, the day before that he is to have his last supper and to be crucified the following day. So again, he's in the temple courts, and he says this to his onlookers, to the audience that is a mixed audience of people who are just there to celebrate the feast, religious leaders, people from all kinds of different backgrounds, and he says this. He spoke to them, again, in parables. Parables is a made-up story, right? This didn't happen. This is something Jesus makes up using everyday illustrations to illustrate a very powerful spiritual truth. So he spoke to them in a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like, or if you want God to be your king, this is what it looks like. If you want to enjoy the banquet or the abundant life or the full life that Jesus has come to offer you, this is what it looks like. It's like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. 
Now, if you've ever prepared a wedding banquet, which is typically the bride, right? And those of us who are married, we just kind of tag along. We're like, just give me the list and I'll take care of it. But it is a lot of work, right? I mean, the reason engagements last so long is because it takes forever to plan a wedding. You got to get the venue. You got to get the cake. You got to kill the fattened calf. You got to do all kinds of preparations, make sure everything fits. The dress is altered. The tuxedos are tailored. It is just a lot of work. And the king is so excited because he loves his son and he's about to throw a wedding banquet. This is probably the biggest party he will ever throw. He is the king. He is large and in charge, and he's got a lot of money. So he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. So this is a king who has a kingdom, and there are people in the kingdom whom he just expects to come. So he, what likely happens, again, this is a made-up story, but in that culture, you'd send out an invitation months ahead of time, right? And you'd get the invitation. You'd say, okay, it's going to be right around this time. All right, I got it. He would make preparations for the banquet. And then when the time came, he would send out his servants to say, it is time for the feast. It's time for you to come and enjoy this banquet that I've provided, which in Jewish culture would typically last six or seven days. So this is a big commitment but they've known about it for months. And so he goes to get the people to join him for the banquet, but they refused to come. And in an honor-shame culture, if you expect people to show up at your party and they refuse to come, you are deeply offended. But he really, really wants them to come to this banquet because he's worked hard to prepare and it's expensive and he wants to honor his son. So he sends more servants and he said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. And here's what the dinner looks like. It's, it's the oxen and the fattened calf, right? He has spent months feeding the calf so that it gets bigger and bigger and there's more meat to provide. There's a fattened calf. It's been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Now, in those days, mostly people ate bread and fish. They didn't get beef very often. Right? And so when beef is offered, you are there. Like you don't refuse beef. This is, and this is good. This is like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. This is the best beef that you can offer because it's prepared by the king. So he just expects everybody to come. But they paid no attention and they went off one to his field, another to his business because these people are like, yeah, I don't really care about the king and his son. I got things to do. I got a business to run. I got fields to take care of. I've got other servants. Six days, that's too much of a commitment. Sorry, king, I'm not going to be there. Well, not only did they ignore the invitation, but they also seized the king's servants. They mistreated them, and they killed them. You talk about incredible dishonor. Craig Keener, who's a biblical scholar, describes it like this. Ignoring the king would be scandalously rude. Original hearers would thus feel incensed at the subject's unbelievable stupidity. Everybody listening to this parable in the temple courts that day are thinking to themselves, man, that is unbelievably dishonoring. And so naturally, the king was Enraged. Now, years ago, uh, I was part of a church, and the pastor's son was graduating high school. And he got up one Sunday, and he said, hey, I'm throwing a big old graduation party. I want you guys to come. I want to honor you. I want to honor my son. And he, he invited everybody, and it was in the bulletin. And um, the son also sent out some invitations. And the day came. It was a beautiful day. It was sunny. Uh, they rented a bunch of tents. And there was food that looked like they had expected about 100, 150 people. There were games out in the lawn. It was just a perfect day. And I showed up with my wife. This is before we had kids. And I showed up, and there were like six other people there. And I was like, oh, no. But, you know, I I got that right when it it had just begun. Maybe some more people will roll up because obviously they're not going to, they're not going to just ignore this, this invitation. I mean, this is like our guy. This is, you know, he's got, this is his son. And hour went by still. There's only like eight of us there. Another hour went by. The entire party, there were only eight of us there. And I just, I felt, I'll never forget that moment because I felt so bad 
for my pastor. I felt so bad for the kid who was to be honored that day. And I was even just kind of a little bit upset at, at the fact that nobody came to this. And so my pastor, he was so enraged that he went out and he burned the entire city. <laughs> See, now you laugh and you're like, okay, clearly he didn't do that. But in this parable, this king was so enraged that he sent his army and he destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And everybody who's listening to the parable is like, well, yeah, that's what you would do. Because not only did they dishonor him by not showing up, but they killed his servants. And so the king is like, all right, I'm burning the city. Done with you guys. And so he comes up with plan B. You ever make it on a, on a, you ever, you ever a B, were you ever on a B list to a party, right? So now he's got the B list, which I was on a B list one time uh, at a wedding. All my friends got invited, and I didn't get invited. I was like 12 years old, and I complained about it, and then I got invited. But the food was just as good, and I had just as good a time. I didn't care if I was on the B list. I was like, I'm just happy to be here, right? It's good to be invited even if you're on the B list. So he comes up with the B list. So he says to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I wanted did not deserve to come. So Here's plan B. I want you to go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find, anybody you find. Give them an invitation. So the servants went out into the streets, and they gathered all the people that they could find. You're saying, like, anybody? Like, no matter what they're wearing, no matter what they've done, if they got a good reputation, if they got a low reputation, if they're thieves, tax collectors, robbers, What about really holy people? He said, you find anybody you can find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests, right? So it's like, here we are. Just kind of picture this. We're at a wedding banquet, right? And we're, we're looking around, and we're, we're just, I'm just like, the king is just happy. He's like, I'm so happy that these people came. This is good. I've worked hard to fatten up the calf, and I've had all the preparations made, and now i got all these people in my wedding banquet. I'm so happy. But then, all of a sudden, he looks out into the corner, right? And he's looking, and, and it looks a little strange to him. He's like, what's, what's, what's up with that? What's going on back there? Here's, here's the way Jesus describes this made-up story to illustrate a pr- spiritual point. He says, but when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And the king is thinking to himself, how dare he not show up with wedding clothes? So whew, he gets a deep breath, gets himself together, you know, gets a little drink of water. And he goes up to this man, and he says to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. In other words, he didn't say anything at all, which tells us that when the man showed up at the wedding, he did not receive the garments that were provided for him. This is, this is a huge point that... When people are gathered from the highways and the byways and out in the country and out off on the streets and they're gathered to come to this wedding banquet, they don't have time to get wedding clothes. They don't have time to iron them and bring them to the dry cleaner and the ladies don't have time to get their hair done and everything to get prepared. It's like, just come because the, the meal's hot. The steak is hot. It's fresh off the grill and we're going to eat. So when you show up at the wedding, I'm going to provide you with wedding garments They're already prepared. They're bought. They are purchased. And and I've I've got wedding garments that fit you perfectly, so just put it on. But apparently this man was so presumptuous that he rejected the wedding garment and went into the wedding without the proper attire. And this guy's like, if you're gonna come to my feast, if you're gonna attend my banquet, You need to put on the right garments. How dare you think that your clothes are good enough? You need to put on the perfect garments that I have purchased and provided for you. So here's what happens. 
the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside. Throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just sounds like a painful, awful place. And then he says this, and this is huge. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited. Matter of fact, we've invited everybody. But few are chosen. Many have been invited, but only a certain amount of people have chosen to put on the wedding garments. And this man has chosen to think that he is okay with his own garments. So, just so we're clear here, let's talk about the meaning of this parable. You've got a king who represents God. You've got the son who is Jesus. And there's the banquet, which is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or the abundant life, right? If you want to follow Jesus, come follow me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an abundant life. I'm going to give you a good life, right? It, it, it's not always an easy life, but it is a good life. It's a better life. The banquet is good. The banquet is good. So back on December 11th, this was uh, just, just a few months ago, we got, um, actually, let me back up. In October, we got an invitation to a wedding that would be on December 11th, just a few months ago. And, and the wedding invitation said, Kira Holbein, and it's going to be in Pittsburgh, PA. So, so this, is, this is a problem for us because I preach on Sunday mornings, and I get up super early. So to get home at 2 a.m., is a sacrifice, right? Plus, I got to get all the kids in the van, and I got to pay for gas, which is $100 a gallon, and I got to go all the way down to Pittsburgh, right? I got to find a place for the kids to, to, to be taken care of, I, and I, I like to give her a nice wedding gift, which is also expensive, but when we got the invitation, Jen, or I, Jen and I are like, we got to go. We didn't even think about it. We were like, this is our girl. Like, I... When I was in youth ministry, she was in sixth grade. I, I watched her grow up all the way into high school. We kept in contact with her throughout the years. She was 34 years old at the time, and we're like, we love Kira. We got to go to the wedding banquet. It's, it's going to be costly, but it is worth it, right? So we make our way down there, get up early, and we make it to the wedding. And uh, I'm sitting at a table during the reception with, with my wife, with a couple other people, one of my buddies, Ron, who I'd known for years, and we're laughing. And all of a sudden, this is this is... I'm not trying to be overly dramatic here. This was one of the greatest moments of my life. Kira Holbein's dad stands up in the middle of the reception. It's just a few months ago. He grabs the microphone, and he says, Hey, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dave Bretch for making an impact on my daughter's life when she was in middle school and high school. Because when she wouldn't listen to me and my wife, she would listen to what Dave had to say. And I'm telling you, it's one of the biggest honors I had ever received. It was kind of like the king, the guy who threw the wedding banquet, looked at me, and he was like, well done. And it made going down there all worth it. It made all the years and the time that we invested in this young lady, it made it all worth it. And then she came over with her white, sparkling, radiant dress, and her husband, who's got a tuxedo, not as nice as this tuxedo, but he came up to me. And he looked me in the eyes, and he said, thank you. I'm telling you, man, it made it all worth it to go to that banquet. Though it was costly, whew, that was a great banquet. So in the parable here, we've got, we've got the kingdom of heaven, which is the banquet. We've got servants who are Jesus' followers saying, the kingdom is here. The kingdom is here. Come follow Jesus. This would be John the Baptist included. Come follow Jesus. The original invitees were the nation of Israel who rejected the king. And the city on fire, most scholars would say, was the destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of the Romans when they came in in 70 AD and set the city literally on fire and scraped the temple off of the temple mount. The later invitees would be everyone, right? The country boys and country girls and the city boys and the city girls, those who listen to country music, those who listen to rap music, tall people, short people, wide people, skinny people, everybody, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, that's everybody. We've all been invited. 
guests with the wedding clothes or the new chosen people or the new covenant that Jesus would call. In other words, it's the Christians. It's the Jesus followers. It's the people that have been clothed in the white garments of righteousness. And the man who refused the wedding clothes represents the unbelievers who have stiff-armed the righteousness that God has provided. So here's here's what I want to really communicate. It's that you've been invited to the banquet. Do you or have you put on the provided garment? Have you put on the provided garment? Do you stand before Christ, not in your own works, in your own righteousness, but in the righteous garment that he has already provided for you. Whew, that's good news. That's good. Here's what Paul would say in Philippians. He'd say, look, I, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Paul would say, and Paul was a really good man, did a lot of good, good things. He would say, look, when I stand before Christ, I'm not standing in, in my own clothes. It's not about my own works. It's not about what I have accomplished or what I have done. It's about his righteousness that he has given to me and that he has clothed me with. Now, here's the thing. You might be sitting there thinking, "Um, am I really that bad of a person? I mean, I, I think I'm actually somewhat righteous. You might be thinking that. Why do I need the righteousness of Christ? And here's what I would say to that is the reason that you think you're righteous is because you compare your righteousness to everybody else instead of comparing your righteousness to the perfection of Christ Jesus, right? If you look around, just look around real quick at the people in the room. Everybody's kind of dressed similarly, Right? I mean, some people wearing jeans, some people wearing khakis, some people wearing slacks. We might have some dresses. But for the most part, you guys are dressed pretty similarly. And next week, I'll probably be dressed just like you. And when you look around and you compare your clothes to everybody else, you're like, good. But when you compare your clothes to this, whoo, you have fallen short. I mean, you deserve to be thrown out into the cry room where there is weeping and gnashing of baby teeth, also known as teething, right? I mean, if you stand up right next to me right now, you will fall short. You, you, now, here's, here's the amazing thing, or here's where this, this analogy eventually breaks down is tomorrow, I got to take this expensive tux that I rented and I got to give it back and put back on my old frumpy clothes, right? The garments that Jesus has given you, they are free, they are paid for, and you will wear them for eternity. They're free for you, but it wasn't free for him. It was expensive for him because he had to give his one and only son. See that? Your righteousness isn't as good as you think it is. Even on your best days, even my best works are tainted with self, selfish motives. So Paul, this is a major theme for Jesus and a major theme for Paul. So I want to hover on this point for just a few more minutes and kind of explain it in some other ways. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. I, I want to show you a, a picture in a moment of the most awful picture of sin that you can ever even imagine. This is awful, this is gross, this is hideous, this is torturous, but this is a picture of your sin and my sin. Awfulness, here it is. The perfect, spotless lamb of God, completely innocent, having all of your sin heaped upon him. You say, why? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That, my friends, is the best news you will ever hear in your entire life. And we'll keep on talking about it because it's easy to forget it because we think, I got to do, I got to do, I got to accomplish, right? I got to make it on the A list. 
Now, here's the million-dollar question. What's wrong with wearing my own clothes? Can't I just wear my own clothes? Well, like I said, your righteous acts are not really all that righteous. Here's how Isaiah would describe it. He'd say, all of us have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Even your best righteous acts compared to the holiness of God is filthy. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Here's the ironic part. You know, if I had a little bit of blood stained on this tuxedo, you'd be like, ooh, ooh. You wouldn't even be able to notice all the whiteness. You'd just be like, ooh, you got some crimson on there. You know, we are all stained with the crimson stain of sin. And you know what washes away the crimson and the scarlet blood? It's the blood of Christ that is so pure and so holy that has washed it away. And that's what we celebrate every week. And that's what we constantly need to be reminded of. Oh, by the way, this verse is also prophetic because just as the crimson tide and the scarlet and gray dominate in this life, in the next life, there will be an eternal whiteout. So you better become a Penn State fan because that's a picture of heaven right there. They're all wearing robes of righteousness, right? See, here's the other problem with relying on your own righteousness when you come to the wedding banquet, and it's this. It's this. When I am confident in my own righteousness, it's hard to resist looking down on other people. Just take a minute and ask yourself the question, do I look down on other people? Not like right now, because I'm like looking down on all you right now, like physically, but do you look down on other people? Like, Like if you find yourself judging other people a lot, you should be terrified. Like, oh, those, those country people, those street people, those Democrats, those Republicans, those people that look like this and talk like that. If you're always looking down on other people, whoo, that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. If you rely on your own righteousness to be pleasing to God, Jesus had something to say about that. Actually, and maybe his most offensive parable at all of all. Here's what he said, to to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Jesus told them this parable. He said, two men, they went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So you've got both sides of the pole. You've got the, the Pharisee who's like righteous, righteous, really holy. Then you've got the tax collector who works for Rome, and they're, they're all the bad people. And the Pharisee comes up, and he's like, oh, God, you should be so thankful that I'm on your team. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. You should be so grateful, God, that I'm not like that tax collector who's a robber and an evildoer. You should be so thankful that I'm not like all the bad people, the adulterers, and the immoral people. (laughs) And the tax collector, like, backs up because he can't even, he's so humbled. And he backs up, looks up to heaven, and he beats his breast, and he says, God, would you have mercy on me, a sinner? And in a shocking statement, Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God, made righteous before God, declared not guilty before God, cleansed before God. He got the garment of righteousness because he was humble enough to recognize how far he fell from that perfect standard. I love this word, tetelestai. If I were to ever get a tattoo, I'd get that tattoo. It's the last thing Jesus ever said before he died. He said, tetelestai, in Aramaic, I don't know the word he said, but it was eventually translated into Greek, tetelestai, which simply means to finish, to fulfill, to accomplish, to bring to a close, to complete, to perfect. When Jesus breathed, before he breathed his last, he said, tetelestai, it is finished. It's not halfway done. It's not 99% done. It has been complete. 
And all you need to do is apply your faith. All you need to do is say, give me, give me the clothes. Give me the garment so that I can enjoy all the benefits of the party. So that I can walk into that banquet and be clothed properly. That's good news, isn't it? That's really good news. I hope you find that to be good news. I hope that helps you to just relax a little bit more and to take a deep breath. And my encouragement to you, this is my sort of action step, simply to do this, to worship Jesus. And I have some ideas of some ways that you can worship Jesus. Um, I gave out books several weeks ago called The Journey to the Cross. Even if you haven't cracked the book, I would encourage you this week to read the last portion of it, read the final week, just to get your mind around what Jesus has done for you. Sarah already mentioned in the announcement video some of the things that we have going on. We got a 5.30 banquet ready for you on Thursday night, also known as a potluck, right? We got a 7 o'clock worship service and communion, Saturday family Easter hunt, and then Sunday we'll celebrate the greatest moment in human history as the stone was rolled away and the, the whole deal was sealed, right? You know, we don't do these things so that our robes can become more righteous, we're shinier. We don't do these things because we're afraid that our garments are going to get a little bit dirtier. Because you can't get any shinier in the eyes of God. You can't get any more brilliant in the eyes of your Savior. He already loves you more than you'll ever realize. We simply do these things to remind us of who we already are in Christ. Saved and redeemed and made holy and made righteous, independent of our works. That's why Isaiah could say this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in garments of salvation and arrayed me. Isn't that a great word? Arrayed me or clothed me in a robe of righteousness. So here's a question for you. Are you dressed properly for the banquet? Have you received the garment of salvation that Christ has offered you? Are you one of the chosen? Have you chosen to receive that garment that is so holy and precious and righteous? You can't earn it. Don't show up with your own clothes. Don't show up with your own righteousness. Just receive it and put it on. And then spend your days worshiping him and honoring him, and giving thanks to your king who loves you more than you'll ever realize. Amen? Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. As the worship team comes up to close out our service, I want to give you just a 30 seconds or so to just be still and to think about those of you who know Jesus are sitting there clothed in righteousness. And those of you who don't know Jesus, the garment is offered to you. Will you put it on? Take about 30 seconds to be still before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that we live in a performance-oriented world. I feel like i got to achieve more and do more so that you'll like me, so that you'll approve of me. I feel like our sin is overwhelming sometimes. We feel sometimes like we're on the outside looking in. 
God, I know we'll always wrestle with that. But I, I just pray that, that in this moment, we would rest our souls in knowing that you paid it all, that I'm dressed in your righteousness alone and I'm faultless to stand before the throne. May we just enjoy that truth. May we live in that truth, that we are sons and daughters of the king, that we are invited to the banquet that the garments have been providing. In Christ alone. Not my works. In Christ alone. Amen.